happy to be here again because we met Jason a long time ago and we became friends and he invited us to be here many times. I think this is like maybe third time. Anyway, I'm reading from this very, very simple book called Koan. Do you know Zen Koan? Yes. Yeah. Check it out. <laughs> so this is just this is not a poem I compose. It's the poems I pick out of life. Like when you encounter something you just so I just dictated the episode. So that's why um, it's called Real Story Poem Series. So I read poem one and then poem. Why? Koan, real story from one. An anonymous stranger cursed me throwing some devastating harsh words at the back of my neck as the slightly out of control city bus door slumped on her after I managed to slip out of it. I turned around to apologize to her for what I have done and for what I have not done. But all I saw was her back walking away from me quickly. I didn't see her face. I don't know her name. I will probably never run into her ever again in this big city. Even if I did, I would never recognize her. Walking home alone in the yellow, orange, red night drizzle of the season, being dazzled by anger in general, I thought of the sound of one hand clapping, but I didn't hear it. One hand clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Language, a real story poem too. I knew I was dreaming. I was explaining something to a group of people. When I woke up, Steve, told, Steve said to me, you must have been dreaming. You said forward. You mean in your language? I asked. Yes, forward, he answered. My original language is Japanese, so that's what he said. Okay, don't explain. Don't explain. A real story poem number three. I sleep facing the wall. Occasionally, I bang into it while I sleep. A wall is always there, whether I see it or not. Clear. A real story poem number four. An almost one century old man wanted to see the island again. He wanted to breathe the air in the midst of a flood moor of a crescent moon-shaped island in the sea again. His granddaughter and her lover wanted to grant his wish, so they accompanied him there for the end of the summer brief visit. One afternoon, in a perfectly sunny and quiet hour, an old man stood on a cliff facing the ocean, captivated by everything his view could hold. Together, they share eternal bliss. Oliver Twist, a real story poem five. My brother and I were born in century 21. Our century, we dance in the subway cars on the weekend. Our father is our ringmaster. We need his love and protection. We ask for donations carrying black plastic bags when we finish dancing. I am too young to know what innocent means. I am still too small and unskirt yet. Major's Pub, a real story poem number six. In Lowell, that's Massachusetts. In Lowell, Massachusetts, in Lowell, an old 
bartender at the bar told us this. Jack Kerouac, of course, used to get thrown out of other bars when he got too drunk and was sent to his bar to be taken care of, where he just started working after turning 21. He was just new there. Nursing Jack was his first job. When he got a little sober, Jack was sent back to the bar where he got kicked out. It was a real story that took place almost close to a half a century ago. Carol. He was a known man. 35 years, a real story poem number seven for me. She was born and grew up in Vietnam, where the war tore everything apart. There, she lost her parents as her daughter, a sister and a brother as a sister, relatives as a niece 35 years ago. Then she moved to America, where the war was over, married and had kids, a girl and a boy, divorced and remarried a good man. Finally, life went on fine. Suddenly, recently, out of nowhere, she lost her son, who was not quite old enough to be 35, as a mother. 35 years later, again, that's all she could say over this new tragedy, because her heart was already too broken. Her husband and her daughter embraced her pain as their own. You know, College, a real story poem eight. Every year, we miss going upstate to see the foliage, to miss witnessing nature's seasonal spectacle is a sin. We feel guilty whenever we fall, we fail to catch it. Usually in the city, leaves change their colors rather quickly and fall to the ground fast. Once on the ground, they get swept away before we know it. But this year, it is moving so slowly with an extra slow motion time for long face. We see all the intricate color changes when we're in the city landscape. It is moving so slowly that it makes you feel like you, yourself, are hanging on the branch. Forage too. A real story poem now, number nine. Unlike most trees, gecko trees have genders. Only female trees bear root fruits. This year, in the corner park, a female ginkgo tree is taking a rest from bearing fruit. Last year, its branches are heavy with them. I admire ginkgos since they are one of the most primordial trees on the earth. They are here when dinosaurs roamed around. They've survived through the history of our planet, and they are still here with us now. In the east, ginkgo berries are considered medicinal gourmet food. We wash the stinky flesh away and break the hard shells to get the light yellow ochre kernel inside. Last fall, old woman from Chinatown walked here to pick berries, and this year, nobody cared too much as they finished their holes rather fast and anonymously. Thank you. The one thing I love to do the most is drink Picot. Now, I, I used to be told Picot was a drink for old men, and now I'm an old man, so it's, uh, it's very appropriate. Perfect seat. 
That's the seat of judgment right there. <laughs> Where the fuck did they all go? They all disappeared. Yeah, yeah, any other so kind of I mean, They're I here have, for Yuko, not you. I even have a bad, <laughs> I even have a bad reputation in Paris. <laughs> oh you can savor that. Oh, that's true. It takes a lot of hard work to have a bad rep here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, really? <laughs> oh, we got now I, out the wrong crowd, man. Now I mix everything. Well, good. Since uh, they all left, I can read for like Jason, 35 minutes. <laughs> oh, we got what happened? You can give us the most controversial. Wait, everything got mixed up. Uh -oh. Okay. Thirst. What does it mean to die of thirst? Who the fuck is talking in the back? Oh, the people at the bar. Okay, you could talk. Just give the bartender a tip and drink a lot. Thirst. What does it mean to die of thirst? We walk for hours in the city of dog shit and piss, only to discover that this false color will be black. Ask anyone. Two mice in the same trap. We drink and drink, stomachs fill, but lips still dry, tongues still thirsty. Did I ask for a drummer on this case? <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? You should have. You should have. You know, I get embarrassed. And, I get embarrassed and insulted very easily, and I have a very fragile. It's very big, but it's a very fragile ego. So, like, you know, like pay attention or go outside like the rest of them did. I mean, God Almighty! Oh Making sure you can have more pecan. Hey, yeah, pecan, pecan really does it to me. You see, the good thing is when you get drunk and you're still dying. No way. We got plenty of time now. Look how intimate it is. Huh? He's a New Yorker. Oh. It's in New York. Yeah, in New York. You know, in New York, in New York, they give you five minutes to read, and if you read for three and a half, they tell you when over time. That's it. We walk for hours in the city of dog shit and piss, only to discover that this fall's color will be black. Ask anyone. Two mice in the same trap. We drink and drink. Stomachs fill, but lips still dry. Tongues still thirsty. Thirst. Our stomachs fill, but that's not what we need. We need our lips, our tongues, our needs to stop. Stop dying of thirst. We are dying of thirst. We're dying of thirst. What does it mean to die of thirst? Do lips become brittle and fall off? Do tongues break into little pieces? Throats become parchment? Do throat singers need drinking? I fuck up that line, so just forgive me. Two mice trapped in the city that stinks of cat piss. We're more feet of step than shit than any city this poor laborer's son has ever seen. This son, who's never been a great grandfather, who has not been a count, who has never intended to elevate the great high. Well, I'm really fucking this poem. Like, Jesus Christ. You know, I had to read this for a radio station the other day, and they made me edit out the word shit and piss. Oh my God! That's pretty crazy, don't you think? <laughs> well, I mean, I fucked up the poem, so I may as well make it all into a joke by now. Anyway. This son, whose great grandfather was not a count, this son who does not intend to elevate to great heights or levitate above the Eiffel Tower, this son who cannot whistle from his throat while singing of horses in his homeland, this son who is not yet discovered inside the belly of a physicist's wife, this son whose poems totter between greatness and mediocrity, this son who is worn black more than half his life, more than half the time, simple son, thirstier than his father, needier than his grandfather, more self-indulgent and in great self-denial, strong-willed and weak, visited upon like a shadow upon a page. The tongue, does it become writing paper? Does the sun eat through the lips like industrial strength toxins? Does it take longer to die of thirst in winter? Thirst, what does it mean to die of thirst? If one eats enough shit and drinks his own piss, will this keep him alive? Can one be thirsty and die of hunger? 
Can one be hungry and die of thirst? Which of the two takes longer? The, the singer's throat. The singer's throat is like a deep memory, and it knows there was no sound system in his grandfather's day. The throat projected its own will. Thirst remained the mysterious charm as the edges of the leaves began to crinkle, and one could only imagine, only improvise, the future of a great-grandson sinking in a city of stone in a century of consumerism with the colors of fall such a short distance away. The colors of fall are black. The colors of fall are black. Wow, uh, yeah. fuck? What? I fucked it up. There's no, if you're happy that I fucked it up, then <laughs> great, okay. You had us. It's still good until you fucked it up. Now, you know, slavery. Slavery is a thing that we all have to contend with one way or the other. Isn't that true? The violent onion flowers and salt water soup calm waving by the Hudson, matter, surface, safety, delay, the cloud sailing on its own, a still, dull, unmoving sheet, both hands sailing in a haze, asleep in the before haze, physical shadow, barely animate. I break wind in the breathing world, and unlike you, I finish the wine without uncorking it, photograph my thirst, and sit startled by the breeze, an unflower filled with flowers and satisfied. Strictly praise honorable gold mutation. Who is the average asshole on the street anyway? Who knows the silence of silence? What difference she wonders rubbing her young man's shoulder, needing to stay in touch, his amber bottle almost gone, 25 minutes of liquid down with the sun, going round like the final reel. And we, for instance, know little about the common bird, or cameras, or swimming, or weeks spent crashing against the rocks, a host of huddling prisoners, soon to be slaves, bottom stained on the slimy, slippery deck. Citizens, I peel my thoughts like onion skin and youthful fears, while the butterflies on her dress fly away. I mean, you guys clap at anything. I mean, come on. Okay, next time, just tell us when we can clap. Or not. So clap. we can do it when it pieces you. Clap, <laughs> clap when the picone comes. Tell us when you're reading a piece of shit or not. Okay, it's all, it's all shit. It's all shit. We must never forget. <laughs> And it all tastes good. It all Steve. tastes good one way or the other, especially when you're thirsty. Yes. I traveled to Giverny for my father, who never heard of Monet, who never stood in front of the water lilies and sighed. I traveled to Giverny for Ryoko, who yearns continually to be an impressionist painting, an impassioned summer walk through a garden on a sunny afternoon. I travel for Giverny despite my desire to stay in bed, despite my losing against myself time and time again, despite the changing Paris sky, the Eiffel Tower's tip, I travel to Giverny. I travel to Giverny in order to blur the boundaries between herb and suburb, tombstones and circuit breakers along the way. I travel to Giverny because she travels to Giverny and because this is one of her dreams and because we are so tired of each other and the city streets we walk for hours every day for weeks and because she cannot go by herself and I cannot go by myself. I travel to Giverny on a train packed with tourists, tourists just like me. I traveled to Giverny with the thought of what I might be missing tonight in some small club in some back street within the city's heart. I traveled thinking about all the calls I should have made within Paris, all the letters I didn't write. I traveled to Giverny for my mother, who sometimes wore dark glasses on hot sunny days, who never stood in the museum garden muttering to the bathing statues. My mother, 
who tried her best to give me a bit of education outside the system, despite her own lack of knowledge. My mother, who loved me so much it hurt, and me not knowing still if to love means to inflict pain. I traveled to Giveny on a train filled with proletarians who, like me, I presume, are traveling to Giveny for the first time for themselves and for others who will never make the trip. We travel to Giveny as the landscape changes from urban to industrial to suburban, green, white collar like Long Island. We'd sometimes visit Long Island. Giveny, I feel like a train wreck and she feels blessed. And we concur that ignorant does not mean stupid. I travel to Giveny as the clouds and sun vie for equal time in the two blue sky to Giveny to experience someone else's life, a guy, just another guy, she admits, Giveny. The genie is out of the bottle and it's just another guy, a dead guy like my father who puts his hand behind his head, closes his eyes and naps dreaming about the colors he used to paint the walls of strangers with, the neat colors that become indistinguishable strokes of paint, the strokes becoming lilies on a faraway pond. I never asked my parents what they knew or what they'd seen or what they've dreamt. Small yellow wildflowers and Queen Anne's lace along the tracks. I never thought I'd meet someone like Ryoko with such honest, romantic, simple, and unfulfilled desires. Her frilly hats and flowery dresses fluttering in the wind of her kitchen. I traveled to Giveny for my brother who traveled to Florida too often. I traveled to Giverny, to Giverny, for my return ticket to New York is not for 10 days, and my return ticket for Giverny is for tonight. Giverny, Giverny, G-I-V-E-R-N-Y, Giver, New York. I traveled to Giverny, I traveled to Giverny, I travel to Giveny for everything I have is in someone else's hands and everything she has is in someone else's hands and everything he has is in someone else's hands. I travel for my father. I travel for my mother. I travel and I travel and I travel and I haven't even gotten there yet and the journey has totally wiped me out. <laughs> I travel to Giveny to Giveny to Giveny to Driveny to Griveny to Giveny to Graveny to Giverny. I travel to Giverny to Giverny to Giverny to see what I can take back with me to see what I can take back with me to see what I can take back with me. That was very doo doo. Very da da at the end. Oh, I got one more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, got one more. you think that was, th oh, like a sound poem type? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that da da. Yeah, that da da shit. I love that. Isn't that it fucking ridiculous getting up here with a, one of the noble arts and making a clown out of yourself? Jason, what do you think about that? If anyone knows, you would know, right, Jason? Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if that's a compliment. I don't know. Jason makes it great. Just get it. He makes it. Jason. <laughs> all right, all right. There you go, Jason. Yeah, we, uh, What's with the right. fucking stupid plastic? Oh, oh my God! All right. I mean, my God! You can, it's like someone it's buy this man. A, it's like New York. Plane ticket back to New York. Yeah, plane, <laughs> <laughs> I got the plane ticket back. I just want to get the fuck back there already. Right? And then when I'm back there, I just want to be back here. Yes. So it's, it's like never. End. So this is a this is a poem for a dear friend of mine, a great uh, African American poet who passed away like in his little room half naked and, and completely quasi-acknowledged. His name was John Ferris, and uh, if you could find any books by John Ferris, you won't only be lucky, but you'll, you'll be very happy. Uh, it's called Another Long Wait in the, in the Waiting Room. It's kind of 
a mediocre indictment of poetry. <laughs> and uh, the names have been changed to protect the guilty. <laughs> I'm not a happy guy. Even if they could, things wouldn't go my way. <laughs> it's true, I hate to say it. No birds sing in the back of my head. No crackers crack. I abuse the little bits of knowledge and speech that I know. Though I know, I know the difference. Always know the difference. Phil is a good poet because he's witty, intelligent, and famous. <laughs> he's been published in at least three languages. People laugh the minute he gets on stage and opens his mouth. His hard work and efforts have made him so. I'm not really sure if birds ever sing inside his head. Will is a good poet. See that peripheral vision, I saw it. <laughs> Will is a good poet because of the color of his skin. He may or may not promote this fact. But it is a fact nonetheless. He is this. He cannot change it. We cannot change it. I'm sure he must hear birds sometimes. The people out here are at the bottom. No matter where they may appear to be, they are still at the bottom. They abuse the little bits of knowledge and speech they possess. They thrive and survive within this banana republic they have helped to create. Sometimes they hear birds outside their windows. Sometimes they see birds on the sidewalk, in trees, in the gutter, on TV, in the movies, in the dirt, in their small backyards. And so do I, and so am I. I try not to partake, but I'm trapped within this banana republic within the peels nonetheless, the peels, all these peels of this banana republic. Bill is a good poet despite his station in life, despite his wit, his color, his speech, his anger, his habits both good and bad, his effect on or his being affected by these jeans we all have to wear, these tight jeans that with great pain he sometimes peels away and sometimes defiantly only thinks he peels away. He hears birds everywhere. He sees birds everywhere the way only a poet sees birds and he lives, he lives to tell their stories. I'm not a happy guy. Even if the birds that call me out of bad dreams on sleepless mornings know this, I see them, I hear them, but never really let them fly into my head, to live inside my head, to visit with me for a while. I know that people will say that these birds I speak of, let's call them my birds, are not original, but they are. I swear to you, they are. Everyone else's birds came to me way after I started writing these words, these seeds. I, I, I didn't even know they were planted. Suddenly they, they, my birds, my birds started pecking at the language beneath my forehead as if behind my skull there hung an abandoned bird feeder or an open palm with traces of bird seed still sticking to the surface. Hey, I fill out forms just like everybody else. People say things, people call names, appointments are broken and kept, pictures hang on walls, sometimes these pictures are of birds, sometimes of flowers, of mothers and babies, of moons over barren landscapes, vultures, vultures though unpopular, are good poets, or so they think, because they're ugly and they wait for things to die. Pigeons, pigeons are good poets,
just because they're pigeons. <laughs> and you know, pigeons, they are perhaps the most famous and recognized poets of all. But whatever happened to the robin with its red breast? Did it smother within the peels of this banana republic while trying to swallow the last virgin seed? The river is cold today. The wind chill is minus 10. There's all this ineffective sunlight in a clear blue sky. And this month will never, ever come again. There are pictures of smoke on the wall, pictures that tell us what we can and cannot do. Even if things could go, they wouldn't. Even if they seem to go, they don't. I, I step aside, but the birds, the birds keep coming. The birds keep coming, their mouths shut tight, their voices mute. The birds, the birds keep coming. The birds keep coming nonetheless. The birds, the birds keep coming. Alfred Hitchcock. Thank you. Thank you, Jason.